Hi, I'm Josh Rushing, filling in for Femi OK, and you are in the stream. After 17 years of war, what are the prospects for peace in Darfur? We'll look at the ongoing Sudanese peace talks. You can join this conversation live in our YouTube chat. Darfur has all but disappeared from international headlines, but for the past 17 years, the conflict in Western Sudan has waged on. Since the overthrow of Sudan's former president, Omar al-Bashir, in 2019, the transitional council that now governs Khartoum has been eager to make peace with rebel groups across the country. So far, talks have missed their original deadline, but continue with some success. Just last week, the government agreed to allow al-Bashir to face trial for crimes allegedly committed in Darfur. Since 2003, fighting between rebels and government-backed Janjawi militia have killed 300,000 and displaced 2.5 million people. Al-Bashir currently faces charges from the ICC that include genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Today, we'll look at the prospects for peace in Darfur. With us to talk about this, Al Jazeera correspondent Hiba Morgan, who's in Juba, where the talks are taking place. In Khartoum, Rudwan Daoud, vice president of the Sudan of the Future campaign, and in Houston, Texas, Sudanese activist Ihab El Tayeb. Welcome, everyone. I want to begin with Hiba. I think, you know, Darfur was a bit of a celebrity issue in the U.S. for a while there, maybe 10 years or more. What has happened since then? We haven't heard much about it. Yes, indeed, Josh. Darfur has disappeared from the headline uh, in the past uh, recent years. Uh, but the conflict there is far from over now. We've been to North Darfur and South Darfur just uh, a little less than two weeks ago, and there are still people who are displaced in camps. There are still people who say that they're worried that they cannot go back home, even with the peace talks uh, going on here in the South Sudanese capital, Juba. They're saying that they feel like uh, these talks are, is not related to them because nobody has come down uh, and sat down with them to consult them on what they need, what's their idea of security, what's their idea of justice, what's their idea of uh, ending the conflict for good. So, you know, we still see um, um, waves of uh, violence or rather outbreaks of violence. Uh, just uh, early uh, January and late December, there were over 200 people who were displaced uh, and uh, some of them even going to uh, do this internally and some thousands going to neighboring Chad. So the conflict in Darfur, while it is not in the headlines as much as it used to be in the past, it is still very much ongoing. Well, Ruan, what's the feeling there in Khartoum? If they're saying in Darfur that they don't feel necessarily represented at the talks, is there any more optimism in the capital? Um, thanks, Josh, for having me. And uh, I definitely agree with what Hiba Morgan just said. I came back from Darfur uh, two weeks ago, and I can tell you there is a lot of uh, disappointment still. There is only little hope uh, about the transitional government. The Darfur people, and I am from Darfur too, mm -hmm. uh, they feel like they have been neglected. Their issues are not even uh, being talked about. Uh, there is no security. Uh, I visited uh, Al Salam's camp uh, just south uh, Niala town. It is one of the uh, largest uh, refugees camp in Darfur. Uh, people are still suffering. They don't even feel uh, you know, that we have a revolution now. Uh, when we went out on the streets, we were talking about freedom, peace, and justice. Uh, we have a little freedom now, at least you can talk. Uh, but we have no peace, especially in Darfur, the Nuba Mountains, and the Blue Nile. We have no justice. Uh, that is what people feel, and they have only little hope. And you mentioned the Blue Nile there. I know uh, some talks have gone on about Blue Nile, Khartoum. I haven't heard much about the Nuba Mountains. But, Ihab, I, I want to go to you. Is, is this part, are these talks, are they part of kind of the a unity movement post-Bashir? What, what's the purpose of the talks now? Uh, thank you for having me, Josh. Uh, I mean, these peace uh, talks are definitely, uh, the government prior prioritized it and, uh, you know, made it a top priority before a lot of other problems because of the neglection that Bashir and the previous regime had on these marginalized regions, you know, whether um, it's through tribal conflict, mm -hmm. tribal conflict or, you know, just uh, neglect of health and, uh, 
and other resources, infrastructure. So uh, I think these peace talks were very essential uh, for this government to be a priority. Uh, and uh, moving forward, like, uh, I mean, Hiba and um, uh, Rodwan mentioned before, uh, they need to be more uh, in, con in contact with, with the people in Darfur that are actually affected, you know, and when, when this revolution started, a lot of... Uh, the main the main slogans of the revolution was freedom, peace, and justice. And uh, as the rev as the time went by, we these uh, slogans kind of being implemented and centerized to the capital again. But you know, uh, the as much as we could fight as activists, as people outside, uh, to broaden the movement and actually have it have these peace treaties reach the people in Darfur. Uh, uh, that would make us happy, the government happy, and everybody in Darfur, uh, firstly and foremost, happy. So, Hiba, since you're in Juba, well, maybe I'm, you I'm, can I'm, clarify this for me. Who is actually representing the people of Darfur at the table? Why is there a disconnect between the people in Darfur and, and whoever is representing them in these talks? Well, uh, for starters, uh, we, we have to uh, be very clear that the people who are in the talks here are mostly leaders of the rebel movements and uh, members of uh, their groups. There are some women's representatives and there are representative of refugees. But, you know, we've, we've again been to South Darfur and North Darfur just two weeks ago. And people are saying that, you know, they've not been consulted. They've not been asked about what their main demands are, what their issues of concerns are, what it, if, if a peace deal is signed, what is it that they want to ensure uh, that they've gone back home? One thing that I heard from some people when we were talking to them in the displacement camps in North Darfur was that, you know, if anything happens in Khartoum, when the price of bread goes high, people go out in the streets. Uh, when somebody's been uh, killed in, in Khartoum, they go out in the streets. When the massacre happened on June 13 at the sit-in uh, in front of the army headquarters, People took to the streets by the dozens, by the thousands, actually. Uh, but they're saying that, you know, the killings happened in, in, in Darfur uh, for years and nobody came out for them. So, the, you know, one one sentence that stuck to me was one of them saying, are we not part of Sudan? Are we not part of them? And, yeah. and so this disconnect between the capital, Khartoum, and those in power and, and the people, and that's, that's probably the biggest disconnect there is. Then there's the rebel movements who uh, were fighting this, this war for 17 years. And, and the people, they're saying that, again, you know, they're just collateral damage. The hundreds of thousands in the displacement camps, they, they, they see themselves as collateral damage because they haven't taken any side and they were just forced to leave their homes. So, so they feel like nobody who's actually with them in the camps can represent them because they haven't gone through what they have gone through over the past 17 years. You know, bringing up the, what happened last year with the overthrow of um, Bashir, and the massacre that happened, what, June 3rd in the streets there with the rapid support forces uh, opened up live fire on the protesters, killing over 100. I think 118 was the number that I saw. Well, those rapid support forces, those are what we used to call Genjoe militia, right? Um, and they fall under control of Lieutenant General Mohammed Hamdan. We can go to my computer. I'll show you here. New York Times has a profile of him, says Sudan ousted a brutal dictator. His successor was his enforcer. So he's known as Hamedi, which is, it's, it's not, it's called the protector, right? It's what that stands for. But he's the guy who's actually in charge of the RSF, which are the, it's the same unit that opened fire on the protesters in Khartoum and are attacking the villages in Darfur. So... Uh, Ruwan, I want to ask you, is, is it a bit like um, the WHO said, new boss is the same as the old boss? Can anyone trust the transitional government if Bashir's right-hand man and enforcer is now one of the leaders on it? You know, um, unfortunately, nobody trusts the transitional government, and, and that includes uh, even the civilian part of this government, because the Darfur people, they haven't seen uh, genuine and practical steps uh, towards mm -hmm. uh, peace or uh, towards solving issues that matters to uh, people of Darfur. Um, everybody knows Himeti was the leader of the Janjaweed, and now the Janjaweed became uh, the RSF, and they are the army of the state. Actually, they're even stronger and more powerful than the uh, Sudanese uh, forces itself. Mm. And you know, but the people of Darfur, they, 
just to be honest here, they do have problem with Hemeti, but they have more problems with the system that had founded Hemeti and supported him uh, to kill his own Darfuris, uh, because Hemeti himself is from Darfur too. Mm. Uh, people uh, look at uh, Burhan as the real uh, criminal, look at al-Bashir, and the whole system is just, um, you know, um, so uh, broke. So the problem is not with Hemeti himself, but with the system that created uh, Hemeti. And it is very provocative to see Hemeti and Burhan both lead the transitional uh, government. And so there's no trust here. Uh, even uh, just to talk about the issue of the ICC, um, you know, all the criminals, including al-Bashir himself, he should be handed over to the ICC. And he's wanted for crimes against humanity, for committing uh, genocide. Uh, but al-Bashir is still being trialed on uh, very minor issues like corruption and this kind of thing. So it is, it is very provocative for all the victims. And uh, people believe that uh, we're not going to see any justice. We're not going to see any peace if the real criminals are still free. Well, okay, so talk about Hamedi and well, Darfur. I'm going to tweet out a story Judge, right now on the from The Independent that says, it's like Bashir is still here, inside war-ravaged Darfur, where deadly violence is killing the revolution. So let's take that off. I just sent that tweet out for anyone who's watching. You can check that article out right after the show. I'm sorry, uh, Hibba, was that you who were just jumping in there? Yes, uh, there, there's something that uh, Rudwan just said, you know, about the fact that people in Darfur don't believe that, um, you know, they, they have an issue with the system that created uh, the deputy uh, uh, president of the sovereign or the deputy head of the sovereign council. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, they feel like the International Criminal Court would be uh, better tried to, uh, better suited to try them for, for the uh, war crimes and for the alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, uh, for us to be accurate, there has been a commission set up by the uh, prosecutor and the attorney general that is looking into those war crimes. But then this issue of handing over former President Bashir and those who have been indicted alongside with him were 41 in total, uh, 51 in total. Um, there, there has been a dispute about what exactly the transitional government meant when they said, you know, Bashir will appear in front of the ICC. Um, you know, initially it was, yes, he's going to be handed over. That is something we heard from the spokesperson, from the government spokesperson, saying that we have discussed this before this round of talks that is currently going on in Juba started. But right after that statement, you know, we've seen the head of the Sovereign Council, who's currently a military, who's effectively the commander-in-chief, uh, we've seen him calling back the military component and the civilian component to discuss this. And they're saying that, no, we're not going to hand him over. We're going to uh, try him here in the country. And that is one of the biggest issues that people in Darfur are, are, are facing, which is the issue of uh, transitional justice or justice as a whole. They feel like the system is not qualified and is not ready to, to serve them the justice that they've been asking for for 17 years now. Well, let's bring in some voices um, from people who were in the displacement camp in Kalma. This is what they say about um, Bashir being tried. We felt relieved when Bashir fell. But now we will feel better when all the people agree to hand over Bashir to the ICC. This is one of our primary demands. The handing over of Bashir is a victory for the victims, a victory for all the Sudanese people, and a warning for any other person to not repeat the same actions. Ihab, does it make a difference if Bashir is tried in Sudan or at the ICC? I think to the Sudanese people, a lot of people want to see El Bashir tried at the ICC. You know, that was uh, uh, something that everybody was rooting for for the longest time. But uh, on the contrary, though, I think uh, the system in Sudan is being placed uh, and, and the progress of this transitional government uh, handing El Bashir to the ICC uh, would not uh, send a clear message to the international community on the progression. But uh, also, I think uh, the transitional government has uh, mentioned that uh, if al-Bashir is not handed over to the Hague, there could be ICC representatives come uh, and trial al-Bashir in Sudan or uh, in the court within the region. And I think 
to the people in Sudan, they want to see al-Bashir at ICC. There is not a lot of trust with the juridical system uh, in Sudan. And uh, people don't think that al-Bashir will be tried, tried fairly uh, in Sudanese soil. And that sends a, a very wrong message to the Sudanese people. Uh, and I think uh, when al-Bashir is tried in Sudan with the same war crimes that he was tried with uh, at the ICC, uh, that that would send a strong message. Uh, but would that happen? That's very questionable. And I but, think that's but why a lot of people that take the same thing from. But one thing we've heard from people in, in the problem. camps, one thing we've heard from people in Darfur is that, you know, we want to see him in the ICC because we're the victims, because we mm -hmm. don't trust the system, because the system created him, the system created him, the system put him in place. Yep. So basically, they, they, they think the whole system is flawed. And to try to make reforms, this transitional government is just six months old, you know, and, and even they say that for us to make the complete <coughs> overhaul of reforms that we've been asking, or you know, people, rather people have been asking, will take some time. And people are saying, you know, again, we've spoken to people in Darfur and what they feel about whether the former president should be uh, tried in the ICC or whether they should be tried in Khartoum, like some people are saying. And, and they say that that's a reflection of, you know, the disparity, the, the this disconnect between the people in Khartoum and the people who have suffered from, from the consequences of the war. We're saying that because, you know, people in Khartoum haven't been there when the bombs were being dropped, when their villages were being burned, when they were displaced. They think that it's, they can wait out on the issue of justice. So even if the reforms are going to take six months, if it's going to take two years, if it's going to take 10 years, people in Khartoum have not gone through that, so they can wait. But those in Darfur say that they've already been living it for 17 years, so they don't have that kind of patience anymore. That's why they've been demanding to uh, see the former president handed over, because they see that they've been waiting They've been waiting for too long, and any further waiting is just a waste of their time. Hiba, I'd like to share a couple of yes, sound bites from that. some of the yeah. people uh, in Khartoum. The last sound bites we heard were actually from the Kalma um, displacement camp, but these are a couple from the streets in Khartoum about whether Bashir should be handed over or not. I agree with handing him over for him to become an example to others because he destroyed Sudan. He didn't do anything for it, and he stole our money. I asked people to organize other demonstrations to pressure to hand al-Bashir over to the criminal court and for him to be punished to set an example to others. As long as there is a law and a judiciary, he must be held accountable inside Sudan. If he goes abroad, foreigners can take advantage of him. We do not know foreigners and do not trust them. I see that the law should be fair and just. He should be tried inside Sudan because our customs, traditions, and values do not allow us to hand over a dog from Sudan to the outside. You know, if you check out our YouTube live event, there's tons of comments coming in right now. And I'm looking at one from Mandate Info that says, ICC is not trustworthy. He can be in custody until the system is ready to take his case. Is the judicial system, Ruwan, at this point, is the judicial system... Could it handle a case like Omar Bashir? At the moment, no, and mm -hmm. clear no. Why? Big no. And, you know, because the system still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the uh, Minister of Justice, uh, for example, Dr. Nasruddin, he is an amazing uh, person, everybody knows, and he's been working hard to fix the judiciary system in Sudan. Uh, but the thing is, uh, there are like just so many things and it's very complicated. Like even for me, I cannot trust that al-Bashir will remain uh, in the prison for, let us say, two years or three years. Uh, nobody knows if uh, he's going to escape. Nobody knows if, you know, um, what is going to happen. It's still some people even don't believe that he is in Cobra's uh, prison. Mm. So, uh, but even if the system is good. Uh, I think Sudan uh, should um, hand over al-Bashir to the ICC uh, because we should respect the international uh, laws and we are part of the, uh, the court. And I think it will uh, do a lot of healings to the victims uh, who have suffered uh, for uh, 30 years from al-Bashir's dictatorship. I want to give props yeah, to our community to for that, that last question. One, uh, if you would allow me, Josh. Yeah, give a jump in here. Uh, Go for just it. Just to add to Radwan's mm. point here, uh, you know, with the last trial with al-Bashir, I mean, uh, he was sentenced at a rehabilitation center at Kobar Prison. So he mm -hmm. wasn't even uh, tried fairly for those charges of corruption. You know, and uh, they let a lot of things slide uh, 
uh, when it came to where the money actually came from. Uh, uh, but to, to, to Rodwan's point, uh, I think we need to respect the people, uh, first and foremost, the people that were uh, affected uh, mainly by Bashir and uh, all his uh, war criminal friends. Uh, and then from there, take it on to the next step and uh, see what actually works uh, with the international community to trial al-Bashir. Mm. Hiba, can you tell us what is life like in Darfur right now and what would they hope to gain from these talks? Well, um, when we went there, you know, we've, we've seen uh, North Darfur and South Darfur. We've seen, the, I would say, stability in the capitals. But then you know, once you drive outside, you would see little villages where uh, you can definitely see the, in, the impact of the uh, 17 years of conflict. You know, uh, many villages don't have schools. Many villages don't have health care centers. Uh, they don't have uh, proper water sources. So it's deeply impacted the development. And let's not forget that these are people who have come out of the uh, displacement camps trying to look some, for some kind of stability. You know, uh, we've spoken to some of them. They say that they were originally farmers before they were displaced and then they were displaced. And now they're trying to basically earn a living by farming of other people's land so that they can be able to earn some kind of income. And let's not forget that the country is already facing a very high inflation. So lots of things are unaffordable for them. And that's just on the side of, you know, development. There's the humanitarian side as well. Uh, people in the camps are saying that the food distribution rations have been cut um, drastically. Uh, and the UNAMED mission, the United Nations um, uh, an African Union mission in Darfur is supposed to be pulling out mm-hmm. by uh, June 2020. So uh, they, they're concerned about that. They're saying that, you know, we're already seeing um, spates of violence in, in, in several villages and several displacement camps as well. We still can't go, go back home because when we go back to the land that once upon a time was ours, we see soldiers there, we see armed men. So that doesn't send a good signal. Uh, so a lot of insecurity, a lot of uncertainty over what comes after, 20, uh, after June 2020. Then you have what's happening here in, in Juba. People are trying to negotiate this whole land ownership, trying to sort out the issue of transitional justice and trying to sort out the issue of security arrangements. But whatever they come out with here, uh, Josh, you know, it's going to take some time to actually be translated from the paper that they're going to sign on to the ground and then to the people who have been affected by the war. And again, we're going to go back to the point where they said that nobody actually consulted us. So even if a deal is reached here and people agree on the issue of uh, how to restore the land rights, how to uh, deliver justice, not everybody on the ground who have been affected by the conflict may actually agree with what is happening here in Juba and what will be signed eventually. You know, you mentioned the the, uh, UN and African Union mission ending uh, soon. Uh, Amnesty International did a report, says Sudan, Fresh evidence of government-sponsored crimes in Darfur show drawdown of peacekeepers premature and reckless. I'm going to tweet this out for our followers so you guys can check that out right after the show. Just sent that out. But, Ridwan, I know that these talks, these peace talks for Darfur have happened. The government of Chad tried to do it in 0405. Uh, UN and AU tried in 06, again in 07. Uh, 2010, 2012, there were the Doha uh, mediators who, who tried to bring peace to the region. And now South Sudan. Why should we have any more hope in these talks than the last talks? You know, these talks are at least better because it, it came right after the Sudanese revolution. Uh, but it's still, uh, you know, what people of Darfur feel, uh, they feel like even those who are representing them, let us say the, uh, uh, the Darfur movements or the military movements in Darfur mm-hmm. uh, are being excluded even uh, from the uh, current government uh, because when the military movement came and they wanted to be a part of the government, they were excluded by the elites of Khartoum. Excluded. Uh, hey, everyone, centrist. I got to stop you there. We got 20 seconds to the end of the show. I want to thank all of my guests for being here. I hope these peace talks work and bring something better to Darfur. That's all the time we have. Thank you for watching. and. See you next time.